Good evening, Senator Bond, members of Congress, Secretary Gates, distinguished guests. Welcome to the Library of Congress and its Jefferson Building. Tonight we gather to commemorate the 20th anniversary of an iconic symbol of one of the most important political developments of the second half of the 20th century, the fall of the Berlin Wall and the serial unraveling of Soviet communism that followed. We had a Nobel laureate neuroscientist here not long ago who said that the human mind is hardwired for narrative. And in human history, stories usually prevail over theories. Stories draw people together, theories draw them apart. Soviet communism was based on a seductive theory that produced a nightmarish story. But American democracy, which was not really based on any theory, produced an extraordinary story. Ronald Reagan himself was a fabulous storyteller who in many ways embodied as well as told the American story. Mikhail Gorbachev had the intelligence to understand that the American and Western experience in the post-war era was a success story and he had the goodness to help Russia disembody itself from communist theory. The result was that rare case in human history of a win-win story. The implosion of communism and the coming of freedom to the former Soviet empire unfolded rapidly and peacefully, climaxing in the collapse of the hardline coup um, in the very heart of empire in Moscow. It was totally unexpected and has not yet been fully understood how 150 armed men prevailed over five and a half million uniformed militia who were essentially loyal to the coup. But that's only because they don't know the moral and spiritual forces that sometimes move great events. And in the story event that began uh, with a wall in Berlin that divided people, suddenly turned into a series of falling dominoes that opened up the pathway, pathway to unity and freedom. Just 20 years ago, this evening, on November 9th, 1989. That event began a new story of families, of country, and of a continent united, and of freedom coming in from the bottom up to end a top-down tyranny. The broader story of human freedom's advance is still, of course, being written, and it's not without setbacks, without struggle and hardship. But the tale of two cities, Berlin and Moscow, has invalidated for our time ideological theory as a legitimate form of organizing human society. It is, of course, too early to tell if this story is one in which people will live happily ever after. But the fall of the wall in 89, like the failure of the coup in 91, has, I think, permanently widened the horizons for human freedom. Ladies and gentlemen, it's with great pleasure that I introduce our next speaker who will introduce the secretary, um, a man to whom we owe a great deal of this evening and of the marvelous exhibits that you've seen perhaps in the members' room down there. Fred Ryan was the ch post chief of staff for former United States President Ronald Reagan. He currently serves as the Chairman of the Board of Trustees for the Ronald Reagan Presidential Foundation. He is also the Vice Chairman of All Britain Communications Company and President and CEO of Politica. It's a great honor to present to you, ladies and gentlemen, Fred and Brown. Thank you. And thank you, Jim, for hosting us tonight in this wonderful venue. It's terrific to see so many Reagan associates and friends that have gathered here this evening. Tonight is the culmination of a series of events celebrating the 20th anniversary of the fall of the Berlin Wall. And I've always questioned whether fall is the correct word, because after all, it didn't just fall down. Somebody pushed it very hard, and we know who that was. Uh, <laughs> The commemoration of this historic 20th anniversary began actually last Friday 
uh, in California at the Reagan Presidential Library. Nancy Reagan hosted a, a group of current and former heads of state from Eastern Europe and some of the men and women who were involved in the forefront of America's stand against communism. And it was very clear from what they said that the wall didn't just fall down. The celebration continued in Berlin yesterday with a concert and a special program featuring U2 and many current and former heads of state, including Helmut Kohl, Mikhail Gorbachev, and President George H.W. Bush. And now today here in Washington, we have the opportunity to, to view an extraordinary exhibit that recalls an extraordinary time and to ask ourselves, how does that time and its challenges relate to this time and today's challenges? And for those of you who haven't seen it, I would urge you before you go to go downstairs to the members gallery to see this really terrific exhibit that Duke Blackwood and the team of curators from Reagan, Reagan Library put together. It has everything from pieces of the Berlin Wall to President Reagan's uh, speech cards that he used at the wall and a number of important artifacts. But this exhibit reflects one of the moments when the president pushed hardest. And that was his Berlin's, Berlin speech in 1987 where he called on Mr. Gorbachev to tear down this wall. And as you know, there was quite a difference of opinion about that famous line. In fact, more people than will admit it today were advising against the president having it in his speech. And the day before President Reagan was scheduled to depart for Berlin, the State Department insisted one last time that the line be removed. But President Reagan remained firm in his belief and insisted that the line be left in the speech he knew it was the right thing to do. Well, our special guest tonight has dedicated his life to doing the right thing as well for America's defense. Secretary Gates is a distinguished public servant who has served at the highest level of our government for several American presidents. And shortly after his appointment as defense secretary, Bob Gates said, and quote, history was not dead at the end of the Cold War. Indeed, it was reawakening with a vengeance. Well, today we live in a different world, but one that also requires American leadership. For as Winston Churchill said in the midst of the Second World War, and I know this is a quote that the Secretary uses often, the price of greatness is responsibility, and the people of the United States cannot escape world responsibility. Please join me in welcoming a man who understands that responsibility. He was at the center of events during the Cold War and remains in the center of world events today to Secretary of Defense Robert Gates. Thank you, Fred, for that introduction. Uh, first, let me take a moment to say that I have just returned from Fort Hood, Texas, where I joined the President in a memorial service for those we lost in a horrific attack last week. I also had a chance to spend time with many of those who were wounded and with the families of the fallen. The President and I are committed to a thorough accounting of what happened and to seeing that the shooting victims and their families have everything they need to recover from this ordeal. So as we gather tonight to celebrate the life and freedom-affirming events of decades past, we should not forget that America's military family remains in mourning. And as we sit here, thousands of troops at Fort Hood and at military bases across this country are preparing to say goodbye to their loved ones and deploy to a distant and dangerous battlefield. Tomorrow is Veterans Day, when we pause to remember the contributions and the sacrifices of all who have worn America's uniform. And so at this point, I would ask everyone here to pause for a moment of silence for those so ruthlessly attacked at Fort Hood last week and their families, and out of gratitude to veterans who have served in the defense of their country. <laughs> 
Thank you. It is an honor to be in such distinguished company to commemorate the fall of the Berlin Wall and to reflect on the role of President Ronald Reagan in bringing about the end of the Cold War. There are a number of old friends and colleagues here tonight, faithful public servants all, who, at least for the most part, have shown themselves to be much better at retirement than I have been. <laughs> Those of us fortunate enough to have worked for Ronald Reagan carry with us many fond personal memories of his kindness, his common decency, and perhaps above all of his sense of humor. I recall one meeting in the Oval Office in early November 1985. As the Deputy Director for Intelligence at CIA, I was one of the briefers. I was seated next to President Reagan, just a few feet away in the Oval Office, and I began my presentation on the stresses on the Soviet system and the corresponding opportunities it presented for the upcoming summit. It was a historic inflection point. The first time, I believe, since the Cold War started that an American president was told by his intelligence service that the survival of our superpower adversary was in doubt in a foreseeable future. Well, a minute or two into my briefing, an incredibly high-pitched screech came out of the president's ear, a high-pitched noise. And if I could hear it, I knew how painful it must be for him. His eyes got wide. He reached up and adjusted his hearing aid in his left ear. I resumed talking. A couple of minutes later, the screeching noise started again. The president, with some disgust, reached up, plucked the hearing aid out of his left ear, pounded it in his palm, and as he was putting it back in his ear, leaned over to me and whispered, it's my KGB handler trying to reach me. <laughs> this was a briefing President Reagan received before his first meeting with Mikhail Gorbachev at the 1985 Geneva summit. At the time, a number of people in and out of the administration were advising that the President's goal for the summit should be to just get by, to do what was necessary to survive the encounter with the younger and allegedly craftier Soviet leader. Well, we all remember how things turned out. After Geneva, Reagan and Gorbachev surely did not become best friends but they at least became best of adversaries, and between them set in motion developments that would ultimately lead to the events we commemorate this evening. And at this point, let me thank the Reagan Library for bringing this exhibit to the Library of Congress. It is a window into a subject that I want to discuss with you tonight, how President Reagan, through his sound instincts, his firm decisions, and his inspiring words, made and seized opportunities, and in so doing helped bring the epic struggle between two nuclear-armed superpowers to a peaceful, and at least from our point of view in history's successful end. Ronald Reagan was, of course, the ultimate cold warrior. As president, his first priority was to restore America's military strength given that nearly 15 years of Soviet modernization and cuts in our defense spending had narrowed and in some areas re erased America's strategic edge over the USSR. A broad U.S. defense buildup began early in the Reagan administration with more advanced planes and ships and submarines and combat vehicles and nuclear weapons added to the American arsenal, including a bold initiative to begin developing a missile defense system designed to render those destructive weapons obsolete. With the strong and courageous support of our NATO allies, intermediate range missiles were put in Europe to counter the earlier deployment of many Soviet SS-20 missiles. President Reagan would use force when necessary. Many remember the 1986 Gulf of Sidra incident with Libya, 
But actually, the world in Libya discovered there was a new sheriff in town as early as August 19, 1981. Libya had extended its claimed territorial waters by 12 miles to what Gaddafi called the line of death. And so it would be. <laughs> President Reagan sent in the USS Forrestal and the USS Nimitz to assure US freedom of navigation. Two Libyan fighters came out to challenge them. Big mistake. Under Ronald Reagan's new rules of engagement, two F-14 Tomcats, without hesitation, splashed the two Libyan fighters. His willingness to use American power was a lesson that others would learn as well. But President Reagan was circumspect about putting or keeping American troops and America's credibility at risk without a clear mission or strong odds of success. Rather than provoke a direct and potentially catastrophic military confrontation with the USSR, President Reagan's approach was to impose ever stiffer costs on the Soviet Union for its third world adventurism. Reagan expanded the containment playbook far beyond Europe and took the fight to the enemy worldwide, from Afghanistan to Cambodia, Nicaragua, Angola, Ethiopia, and elsewhere. Soviet surrogates soon faced their own lethal insurgencies. And as, all we, as we all remember, his stirring words and his administration's actions, both overt and covert, gave hope to dissidents and millions of others trapped behind the Iron Curtain. While countering the Soviets with varying degrees of fervor and success had been a common feature of every administration since the end of World War II. Under President Reagan, this struggle gained new moral energy, purpose, and a sense of urgency. One small but telling anecdote. Early in the Reagan administration, Jimmy Carter's national security advisor, Spignev Brzezinski, continued to stay in touch with CIA director Bill Casey about Poland, a cause and a country dear to Brzezinski's heart and to the heart of the new pope, John Paul II. In one conversation at a cocktail party, Brzezinski complained to Casey that funding for one of his favorite Polish covert actions had been reduced. Casey asked how much it would take to remedy the problem. Spig said about $18,000. The next day, a man showed up in Brzezinski's office unannounced and unidentified and handed him a briefcase containing $18,000 in cash. <laughs> Brzezinski, more than a little nonplussed, nevertheless passed it to a Polish visitor on his way home where it was put to good use. The sum total of these measures, large and small, communicated loud and clear at home and abroad that post-Vietnam, post-Malaise America was back, strong and resolute. As for the Soviets, President Reagan, nearly alone, had the bedrock conviction that their rotting system was vulnerable and could be brought down not as some vague sweep of history eventuality, but something he could see in his lifetime. So how best to take advantage of this vulnerability? President Reagan understood that erasing the impression of US political and military weakness would ultimately reap diplomatic rewards and strategic breakthroughs. He embraced the importance of military strength and of speaking blunt truths about the Soviet system and Soviet behavior. Remember the evil empire speech in 1983? Drove Moscow nuts. No one spoke these truths with more credibility or more eloquence. But President Reagan also had the insight, the sense of the historical moment, to know when it was time to sheathe the sword soften the tone, and re-engage, even with our most implacable and dangerous enemy. Reagan knew this early on, even during the most tense days of the first term. 
In August 1984, following what was arguably the most dangerous 18 months of the Cold War since the Cuban Missile Crisis, we witnessed him weighing Secretary of State Schultz's information that Soviet Foreign Minister Andrei Gromyko might be interested in a meeting with the President during the UN General Assembly. All such meetings had been suspended after the Soviet invasion of Afghanistan in 1979. President Reagan responded that he wanted to see Gromyko. And Secretary Schultz makes clear in his memoirs that this was the President's choice and his alone, that he, Secretary Schultz, had not even made a recommendation. And we can now see that this small gesture was the beginning of a turning point. President Reagan was often accused of liberal critics of shunning engagement with the USSR. Reagan only half-jokingly responded that it was kind of tough to engage with the Soviet gerontocracy when its leaders kept dying on him. <laughs> After all, three of his counterparts expired within three years, between 1982 and 1985. But finally, in March 1985, Mikhail Gorbachev came to power, and Reagan had somebody to deal with. In Gorbachev's first months, there were a series of offers, proposals, and promises to make reforms at home while reducing the threat of confrontation abroad. It was not that Gorbachev was to be seized upon as some sort of savior, but rather from the standpoint of presidential leadership, the challenge and the historical opportunity was to make the most of what Gorbachev claimed to be offering. And even in the midst of glasnost and start and reduced superpower tensions, President Reagan again and again would return to words strong and true, making them, as Margaret Thatcher said, fight like soldiers to give the Soviet leader and the system he was trying to save a final push into history's dustbin. Which brings us to Berlin and its scar upon European civilization. The wall that as of June, 20, June 12, 1987, had divided that city and its people for nearly 26 years. President Reagan stood at the Brandenburg Gate that day and against the advice of many in his government, uttered those famous six words, Mr. Gorbachev, tear down this wall. Those six words not only rebuked the dictators of the Warsaw Pact, they voiced a fundamental truth, that freedom was a worthier path, that those who were hemmed in by the wall, those who thirsted for political, economic, and religious freedom in East Germany and in the other captive nations would eventually stand up, demand it, and attain it. President Reagan also said in that Berlin speech that the United States would pursue arms reduction treaties with the Soviet Union even as we retained the ability through force of arms to deter acts of aggression. He made clear that we did not value ICBMs and tanks or warships in and of themselves. They were all negotiable. No, the West's differences with the East the democracy's dispute with communism was, he said, not about weapons, but about liberty. The Cold War was a struggle of ideas and economic systems, and he insisted that this not be forgotten. Nor was the exclamation about the wall a total surprise. Other U.S. officials at various times and in various ways had called for its removal. One interesting historical footnote highlighted by the historian James Mann, President Reagan's Berlin speech outraged Erich Honecker, the East German dictator, in that he, Honecker, was not even mentioned. <laughs> like any insecure bureaucrat, he felt slighted and out of the loop. President Reagan had gone over his head to Gorbachev thus calling attention to the fact that the Honecker government's power was founded not on the consent of the East German people, but on the writ and the whim and the guns of its Soviet overlord. 
All told, President Reagan's statecraft was a subtle two-step, to push and prod for reform, democratic and economic, while being willing to parlay with his Soviet counterpart, and eventually agree to deep cuts in the U.S. Ar nuclear arsenal. Often, he was a number of steps ahead of his critics on both the left and the right, some of whom could not make sense of the combination. But I believe Ronald Reagan was far more shrewd and in control of events than either his critics or many of his supporters thought. Six months after the Berlin speech, President Reagan sat down with General Secretary Gorbachev and signed the Intermediate Nuclear Forces Treaty, which abolished, for the first time, the use of all intermediate and shorter range missiles by the two countries. And two years later, the wall that I never imagined would come down in my lifetime was finally breached. On November 9, 1989, I was working in the White House as Deputy National Security Advisor. No one who watched on television will ever forget the images of East and West Germans that night dancing on the top of the wall, hacking away bits of it for keepsakes, and finally taking down whole sections with construction equipment. The next day, President Bush spoke with West German Chancellor Helmut Kohl by telephone. I was the note taker on the call. Chancellor Cole told President Bush that it was like witnessing an enormous fair with the atmosphere of a festival. There were hundreds of thousands of people in the street, he said, and no violence. Within two years, the other Soviet satellites had broken free as well, and again, largely without violence. The effort to reform communism, as suspected, actually ended up sweeping it away, for its foundation was force and terror, and without them, communism could not survive. Today, almost 20 years later, 20 years after the wall fell, we marvel at the different world we live in. It is still a dangerous place, to be sure. In many ways, geopolitics are much more complex than when two nuclear-armed superpowers tested each other. But communism's demise holds lessons for us even now, and they include the enduring value and broad appeal of freedom, political, economic, and spiritual, and the idea that free men and women of different cultures and countries can, for all the squabbling inherent in democracy, come together to get the big things right and make the tough decisions to deter aggression and preserve their liberty. And this gives us reassurance, as each new generation always, at some point, is called upon to make that stand. It is a sad reality that in our time and in the future, as through all of recorded history, there will be those who seek through violence and crime to dominate and intimidate others. We saw this on 9-11. We see it today in Afghanistan, where more perseverance, more sacrifice, and more patience will be required to prevent the terrorists who attacked us from doing so again. We see it anywhere. Nations, movements, or strongmen are tempted to believe that the United States of America does not have the will or the means to stand by our friends, to meet our commitments, and to defend our way of life. As President Reagan said just over a quarter century ago, it is up to us in our time to choose and choose wisely between the hard but necessary task of preserving peace and freedom and the temptation to ignore our duty and blindly hope for the best. I close with a quote from Anatole France, who wrote, to accomplish great things, we must not only act, but also dream. Not only plan, but also believe. President Reagan was a great president who acted and planned. But most importantly, he dreamed and he believed. And he truly accomplished great things.
This evening, as those of us fortunate enough to have known and served Ronald Reagan gather on this historic anniversary, let us be thankful for this great and gentle man, the country he inspired to believe in itself again, and the people and the nations he freed. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Secretary, for sharing those wonderful insights and reflections with us. We know it's been a full and difficult day for you, and we very much appreciate having you and Mrs. Gates with us this evening. And to the Reagan Associates here tonight, I would just say, let's not wait another 20 years to get together. Uh, that, in fact, I think many of you know President Reagan's 100th birthday is less than a year and a half away and their entire series of events being planned right now by people at the Reagan Foundation will be taking place here and across the country to celebrate that occasion, and we look forward to everyone here being part of it. Thank you for joining us this evening.